Thank you, thank you, Franz and Peter. It was a very interesting talk, and I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more in the years ahead about where and what you're going to be doing. It certainly uh, points to a, um, a better bees future or a better, better breeding future, which is the way we, we should be going. Our next speaker is uh, John Hartnell. This is coming up over here to talk about the the Products Standards Council and stuff. <coughs> and stuff. So, welcome, John. Well, good afternoon everybody and uh, welcome to Christchurch. It's the Jake Isles, as you know, and uh, we've had a few couple of rearrangements in the last uh, week or so with the uh, ground shaking in bits and pieces. But it's always good. It's good to um, get your keys act uh, Queens activated early in the year when they start shaking around like that, so you put them on a truck and take them around the block. Now today I want to address a few uh, points. Uh, I just wanted to cover a presentation that was done in uh, Napier just the other week by the Big Product Standard Council. Uh, the Big, it's made up of uh, a group of people from the NBA, BIG and the Honey Packers and Exporters Association. It is, it is probably the united uh, body that we have at the moment and it's doing a great job as far as dealing with the issues that are coming through from the Ministry of Primary Industries and market access concerns etc. They, they are coming at us now on a weekly basis and they come because of the sophistication that we're seeing uh, overseas with the honey testing and, and bits and pieces. I had another incident just this week uh, with some thyme honey, which is a first and uh, it's a challenge, but you've just got to work through them and, and show them how incorrect their analysis is in many instances. Anyhow, here we, so here we go. No, we don't. Okay, so the Big Product Standard Council, it's designed to be that, um, the gateway between the, uh, the government and our industry, and as I said, it's working very effectively. It's working in the wider interests of all beekeepers. It's not political, it just gets on and does the job. Uh, the governance structure of it is, is uh, set up, and, and we have representation from all the three different industry groups I talked about, which is the NBA, the BIG, and the Honey Packers and Exporters. Uh, association, and it is the, it is the place where uh, government come when they have concerns about our industry, whether it be honey standards, uh, concerns of market access, or other bits and pieces that uh, tend to rock on quite regularly for us. Makes some interesting listening on the other side, I guess. Okay, I'm just going to make this thing work. Okay, so here, here are some of the problems that we're, we're facing right at the moment, and Paul Bolger touched on those for us. Firstly, is C4 sugar or sugar cane syrup uh, being found in honey products as they enter countries around the world? And we're having particular concerns with uh, uh, Manuka honey and uh, we're having a number of rejections now both in Europe and in America and I just received some information this morning of another two companies that had product held up at the border for testing. Now C4 Sugars is, uh, we believe that the test it's itself is, is not correct uh, and we're working extremely hard at the moment to try and uh, put together a testing regime that, is, that gives us a true outcome uh, for our product. Now that's, that's one of the first uh, major ones we're dealing with and something that we, we must get on top of because it is affecting our most valuable honey product and that is the Manuka honey. St honey standards, as we know, this has been around for a long time. Honey standards were developed way back in 2002. The Bee Product Standards Council adopted them two years ago as the base standard. Uh, we haven't made them mandatory or anything like that because there's a lot more work to be done on that. But we've now handed that project to the Standards New Zealand and they will be uh, correlating how the honey standards will move forward in the, in the future for model floral honeys and other uh, products that are coming out of the bee industry. 
The PA project, well, that's, that's a major one because Europe have already put voluntary standards in place. We are now operating to a maximum residue PA loading of 50 parts per billion on any honey that's exported into Europe. And that's been picked up also by the Japanese who follow very quickly on behind uh, the Europeans. Now the PA project, two years ago, or just about two years ago now, we harvested, uh, thanks to um, Steve Little and a team, Pete Bell, down in uh, Twizel, they harvested four tonnes of blue borage. We had it lying on the floor in Steve Little's honey uh, storage facility for 12 months, drying it out. That has subsequently been taken now and we are in the process of starting to break that product down uh, to a point where that the residue that we're looking for, the the ecum, ecodem, ecodem, whatever it is, runs will know it better than I will. Um, when we got that, we get that down to a base product, that's going off to America to be basically distilled down so we can get some pure product. Once we have that pure product, we'll actually be doing toxicity testing to determine at what level uh, the, the PA can be ex accepted as a food product, within a food product. So they'll get down and work out exactly what it is. We believe that our um, Vipers Bugloss in New Zealand is a very low toxic product, um, but we have to prove it because at the end of the day, all the Europeans are doing is benchmarking our product against uh, the rest of the world and saying that the PAs are an unacceptable um, uh, item within the honey product. We have a lot of work to do, uh, but it's most important, and you, if you're a South Island vegan, which most of you are, you'll understand that in your white clover there's often a percentage of borage in there, and uh, that has a great influence on how what we can do as far as exports are concerned. This year, I know that at least 100 tonne of product was not able to enter the EU market because of uh, the PA loadings. Tootin, well as you know with Tootin, uh, we've got standards in place now, put in place by New Zealand Food Safety or MPI as they know now. We operate to those, but we just, as, as uh, I think Paul Bolger pointed out before, 1,200 new beekeepers in the last two years, and there's just no way that we're getting good coverage with them on the Tootin standard and how to manage those hives. So one of our programs now is to develop a, a small DVD which will go out to all new beekeepers. As they register, they'll receive that free of charge and with that is designed to try and educate those beekeepers on the uh, requirements to operating in a, in a Tootin area. Now the Tootin area, just if you don't know, oh, there's about Kaikoura North, I think it goes all from there all the way up to the top of North Island. They're all classified as Tootin areas. When you sign your harvest declarations, you're actually signing a statement that you know what's going on in your area. You've either had your product tested for Tootin or that you're in an area which is of low risk. And you can prove that by having the appropriate documentation. So understanding what that requirement is. Tootin, when you sign your harvest declaration, it is a statutory legal document, that statutory declaration, and it is, has a lot of weight sitting behind it. So you need to be extremely careful what, what, what's happening. We've got uh, SEMs, you won't have heard of that probably before, semi carbazides They are the marker for, the, uh, for antibiotics. And we're finding in some honey, like Kamahi and Thyme, that these SEMs are showing as a positive. And from a European perspective, that's an automatic failure. Thus, they're then stating that that product has had antibiotics, uh, um, and that antibiotics have been found in that product, and uh, it's not able to have access to the, to the marketplace. Now, we know in New Zealand that antibiotics, and if anybody doesn't know, it's illegal to feed anything to bees other than what's registered. And uh, of course, we, we, we are out there on the international market making that point very clear that New Zealand operates with a no drug policy. Um, the SEM positive coming up uh, are, are, are a false positive, but what's being placed on it, New Zealand to prove that that's a fact rather than the other way around. And this is what happens when you're operating in the international market. If they have a standard, you have to go out there and actually prove that their standard or their testing system is wrong. Um, we have to do the science, we have to have the science peer reviewed, and then they have, you have to move to try and get that test uh, taken in as the, as the next generation test. So all those things are frustrating, but these are the things that the Beat Product Standard Council are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And we have a, a very um, heavy email traffic with the BPSC, and these are the reasons why that is. Okay, so how does, how does beekeeping practice affect your honey? With, this is talking about two things in front of us. 
One is sugar syrup feeding and the other is pollen patties, or protein feeding, uh, in the areas where there's a shortage of, um, of uh, good pollen. Both of these have the potential to affect the value of your honey and they have the potential to cause enormous problems at the other side of the world if your product arrives over there and tests positive uh, for, for such things as C4 sugars. So here we go, you can see that some, some markets have started to reject New Zealand honey and I'm not, gonna, I'm not a scientist, I can't do this whole thing that uh, Karen Rogers can, but simply it shows that, that um, the codex standard is, puts a base level on things and what we're finding is our, our, the testing of New Zealand Manuka honey in particular is throwing up a high level of, of C4 or cane sugar uh, in that product and it's, it's a challenge. We believe again that it's, a, a, as I said, a poor test but it, as it stands at the moment that's the rules and we have to, we have to go, if we want to change it, we have to prove it and that we have a project operating now on C4 sugars in association with Agmart uh, to, to, do the, to do the science and to prove what's going on. I could say that at the moment we also know that in some honey there has been too much sugar fed. And that's a known fact. Now sometimes that's the re result of uh, the feeding that's required within the pollination of products such as kiwi fruit, uh, pollinating of kiwi fruit. There's a requirement to actually feed sugar to those hives, I think every second day or something like that. Yeah, so it's, we're in there and we're, we're having that change over from pollination to, to into the manuka crop and the potential for any residue of, of sugar being lifted up into the honey surface and then transferred into the honey production side of things. New Zealand honey standards, as we've talked about, this is something we need to, to absolutely focus on. It protects our position and provides us, puts a stake in the ground as far as New Zealand's concerned um, with our product and it gives confidence around the world. And we need to be making sure that we are really pushing that on an international basis. Uh, we've probably covered enough of that, but as you can see, highly important, particularly when we're looking at uh, of Manuka, and now we've of course, of course got jelly bush in Australia, and I know that the, over in Chile and Argentina they're hunting every different honey variety they can find to be able to stack something up and, and say that it can stand alongside Manuka on the shelf. PA project, as you can see, that's what we're looking to do. It's the, toxic, the toxins that are coming out of that plant, we need to prove that our product is not uh, creating any problems. We believe that it is a very low toxic product because often during the dry summer months of, in the South Island, blue barrage is actually fed as, a, as, a, as an animal feed. That's what the animals are grazing on and we're not seeing them falling over in the paddock or uh, coming to the works with the liver spandy damage or anything like that. So we're confident where we stand that we have to go out there and prove it. Um, that probably covers a wee bit more there. 200 different PAs, but where we're focused right at the moment is on Bipus Bugloss because that's the one that internationally they're, they're biffing back at us. If you, if you can read that and understand it, that's good, I can't, so I'm just going to go straight past it. There's a bit more work there on, on the PAs, codex, etc. I'm not going to go too much. Bipus Bugloss, you know what it is, where it lives. And we've often heard that um, it's a South Island problem. Well, I can tell you it's not. The, the distribution of Vipers Bugloss is right throughout New Zealand and we, all we know it's, it's a lot more in the South Island because we as beekeepers spread it. We went out there and threw the seed around and made sure it was there because it's a great plant for, uh, for honey production but unfortunately it wants to come back a wee bit and might, might bite us for a while. There's another PA plant around Europe. We do see that up the, under, under the honeydew area. Um, we've had uh, PAs positive testing in honeydew and we believe that's probably where it's coming from. But there are not large areas of that plant there like we see with Vipus bugloss so we don't quite have the same volume of, of, of trouble. But again it recognises that there are other plants out there with VAs. Ragwort, you know enough about that. Um, it's a nasty product, it will kill livestock and uh, it obviously has a very high PA loading and it's an unacceptable situation to be facing. So that PA project's underway now. Um, it's costing a lot of money, and uh, we're uh, working hard to to fund that. We, we've got money from the Sustainable Farming Fund as part of that project, and they've been excellent to work with. But at, as always, we have to put up funding from the industry itself. And right at the moment, we're operating on very good terms. For every dollar required, 
the sustainable farming fund are putting up 70 cents where we could put up 30 cents. So we're getting a great deal. Perhaps as Paul covered before, probably the best deal in the industry, of all industries at the moment, as far as, uh, as the bees are concerned. But of course, it's the most, most important industry out there in agriculture, and that's why bees are vital for New Zealand. As you can see now, at, currently at the moment, export markets are lost. Some product cannot go into those markets. And uh, white clover traditionally has been a very uh, large part of the EU import. It, it backed on from uh, Canadian clover, which has been established in market for a long time. I can tell you right now that Canadian clover is not being sold in Europe uh, because they have uh, GMO pollen, rape pollen in their honey, and it, the Europeans this year, or just late last year, banned GMO pollen and all food products unless it's registered or not. So at the moment, most of the European honey packers have, dro have dropped clover honey from their packing plants, which is not good for us. So we're working very hard now to try and re-establish that and, and, and encourage some of those packers to stay with us as far as New Zealand is concerned. But you can see uh, an outcome from a from a, a different country can have an enormous impact on how we can operate and how we can sell our products in the market. So the PA project is it's on its way. We're into it, and I'll be talking about to you a bit, a bit more about that. We've got Catalyst uh, R and D who are helping to manage that project. Jane is based in Canterbury, so it's an advantage an advantage to us, and uh, we need support from industry. All right. So this is the project itself. Now it's an interesting project because it's not all about the bee industry, though we're the focus. I think it's more about uh, the understanding of where Vipers Pugos lives in New Zealand and its, its potential crossover into the food chain, and that, particularly with uh, sheep meat and beef meat. And because there are real concerns that uh, perhaps these toxins are carried in meat products as well. We know they're out there in grain because they're picked up accidentally. We know that they're out there in products like tea, um, and we've had instances of that in, in Europe where that's caused massive problems. But I think there's a, there's a growing understanding that perhaps the PA issue's a little bigger than just the honey industry, and so there's a bit of work being done in there, and that's why some of that funding's been made, made available to, to, the, to the amount that it is. So there's the outcomes. A mapping platform, industry conferences, a risk management program, and it may be that we end up that, that there is a risk management program for PAs, but we'll have to determine that as it, it rolls along. Um, very much like there is with uh, Tootin, but in a slightly different framework. So uh, just a note here that it's, it's commercially sensitive because it affects our access to markets. Um, so it, we'll, be, we'll be passing the information out within the industry, not necessarily out by the media, all right, just for that simple reason. However, I will tell you now that we have a, a young reporter now who's very uh, hot on the trail of C4 sugars and very keen to write a re very large article for the New Zealand Herald, Herald next Sunday. And uh, I don't know how what like the honey industry will be uh, con con um, conveyed, if you like, in, in that particular article. So we're working to try and make sure she has the, the real facts. So that's just who's, who's, uh, who's part of it, who the group's with, who's doing what. The two video I've touched on already, and uh, that's an education thing. We, we cannot afford to have another uh, situation where we have uh, people becoming ill th through tooth poisoning. Um, it will kill somebody if we get it wrong, particularly if it's in comb honey. And we have great concerns with the new beekeepers coming on board because many of those are based in the North Island and in the tooth <coughs> area. So, and we, we know we're not getting to everybody and we know that that's a really important thing to, to have as part of our arsenal to educate people. Market reactions, what happens, regulators, alerts. When there's an alert, it goes out in Europe, it goes to the red flag, and it goes around the whole of Europe. If the New Zealand honey stopped at the border, that has advised all the way right through. I've had a product just recently um, that, that caused that situation was an SEM uh, test loading on a Carmody product. Uh, that red flag went right around Europe and back again. And the first reaction you get is from your international clients who say, well, is that another test we've got to do now on your product? Uh, what are you doing, et cetera, et cetera. And it just makes it a bit harder for uh, us as exporters. We, we don't want permanent barriers, which is what region we try to make sure. So we're talking about reputation reward. Um, New Zealand has very good reputation. We sit at the, 
the top of the honey industry uh, right around the world. We, we achieve the best prices for our product that anybody does in the world. And there's a reason for that. We need to protect it and we need everybody to be extremely conscious about it. Uh, as uh, Paul, Paul touched on before, if Australia honey does come into New Zealand in all probability, maybe it will, I hope not. But if it does, we'll need to export more product overseas at our high value and, and to counter the challenges we're gonna face domestically. And uh, it's most important. The export market, when I started in this business, which is a long time ago now, something like 1977, export was something that people talked about and didn't do. And then we started to, to change that and, and move it forward. And it was always the, it was the second best friend. The best friend was always the domestic packer. And if we had a bit of service, the exporter might get some. But the reality is that whole thing's turned around now. And export now is the whole basis of our industry. It provides us with the high dollar and it means that uh, that reward can come across. And by default, it's lifted the value of all honey in New Zealand. So it's a, a really a, a, a fantastic story. But we need to make sure, we need to be going out here now and looking for the next story about New Zealand honey. Maybe it'll be clover or honeydew or kamahi or thyme or one of these other products, not just manuka. But we need to have the resources to do that and we need to have the people out there that are prepared to, to back their industry up with some hard earned cash to develop the opportunities because we're going to need them. Consequences of loss is pretty explained up there. If we have a disaster over there, and let's take the worst scenario, and Manuka was uh, deemed to be uh, unacceptable in the marketplace. You can imagine the impact that would have on New Zealand beekeeping. Massive impact. Um, and it would be extremely challenging if you're a domestic packer, because every beekeeper in New Zealand would be going back and putting product in their own pots and trying to fly it off everywhere. It would just be an absolute disaster. So. Um, very important that we get these things right and very important that you guys understand you're going to have to put your hand in your pocket to make these things happen. You can't come along here and get a free lunch like you've had today. You can't have one of those every week, I'm sorry. You're going to have to pay. you just got to get that in your head. There it is. This is what where some people are now. These ostriches, they've got the heads buried in the sand. You can't see a bloody thing, right? I like to think we're all meerkats in the South Island and we're up there and we're looking for opportunities. And that's what it's all about. And most important to win, we address that. You can't wait for somebody else to do it for you. You're going to have to get yourself involved. So the way forward, um, we need to regain market confidence and we need to make sure that uh, the Ministry of Primary Industries are right on side with us and they're standing side by side with us when we've got to go to battle. The industry needs to be united, and you've heard it already from Barry and from Paul Bolger. I've been banging away this for six years. I mean, if you haven't heard me now, there's something wrong. We've got to be united, we've got to stand together, and we need to put our dollar and invest that really wisely. Um, and that means all beekeepers, and particularly all commercial beekeepers, because there's a lot out, of them out, there, right, out there right now who pay absolutely nothing to nobody, but they take the benefits of the work that others do. And that's an unacceptable position. So again, as Barry touched on, are we at a time now where we have to reconsider having a, a levy, uh, actually a, a, a levy of an order for a levy um, to help us with our, the funding of our industry uh, for research and develop and also for that new market opportunity the things that we need to get out there and, and look for. And I think that's really, really important. We need to understand we've got to go out there and be looking for more opportunity. I can tell you from a a um, BPSC and the uh, Feds B side of things at our conference in Twizel uh, in June. Uh, from the floor, I think the gentleman's actually here, I don't know if you do it again, but anyhow, he was here. And uh, on, from the floor, they voted to put in a voluntary levy, R&D levy, of a dollar a hive per year, per annum, or per year, all right? So, and uh, that has already started. It was, a, it was it's an absolutely, absolute bonus when you're sitting in the Bee Products Town Council looking for where your money's going to come from. So we've started that process and I'd encourage you to be involved in that. If you don't know what that means, just come and see me and I'll explain it to you. We'll talk to Mark Graham. He's just sitting over there. Can't talk to Alan Hill, he's asleep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's very important and, and we, uh, the Honey Pants and Exporters Association met in uh, Napier and they have also uh, pledged a voluntary contribution of $20 per tonne of product they pack for export in the domestic market. So these guys are starting to understand that it's really important to be part of that and to, uh, to make those decisions. And 
just be come involved. I don't care whether you belong to Fids Bees or the NBA, but for God's sake, belong to one of them. Because if you're not there, you don't get the information. There has to be a day like this where we, where we do have a free lunch that brings 150 people out. But it shouldn't be like that. You should be coming to this meetings because it's important for your industry. And you need to be part of that and you need to make sure you front up and pay your dues as well. There we go. Pretty simple. United we stand, divided we fall. We've tried to divide it, but it doesn't work. I can tell you. It's too hard. <laughs> too damn hard. You want to go, you feel really stupid when you're going to hold hands and roll up to see David um, Carter and all these, these guys. Just, uh, the, the great thing I think is at least we're holding hands we're going to now before we used to throw things at each other. But it's, again, what a waste of energy and time. Just ridiculous. No free riders. Just remember that. Don't be a free rider because it's not fair. Alright? So there you go, there's a choice. Do I continue in business? Do I want my business to be successful? Am I part of the problem or part of the solution? You want to be part of the solution. That's that's the only one. That's really, really important. Okay, enough on that side. Just a quick touch on, as uh, Paul Bolger said, I'm part of the six-man uh, panel governance group for New Zealand for the GIA biosecurity security side of things. We are progressing it. It is the reality of what the biosecurity will look like in the future. The big industry is going to have to make some decisions at some point. But they don't have to make big ones now. We certainly are in a position now where we, are, we will most likely, I think, between us as a, as a group, sign a memorandum of understanding with the government to explore the value proposition of the big industry being involved in the new GIA or government industry agreements for biosecurity moving forward. We'd be absolutely stupid not to go and have a look. Um, we need to explore it. And uh, I think the advantage that we have uh, is that when we it comes down to who pays, there are, there are a lot of other industries in New Zealand that are totally reliant on the services we provide for pollination, and that will be to our benefit because we won't have to fund everything ourselves. The key root fruit industry are going to fund far more for the bees than the bee industry for themselves because of the sheer value of the uh, outcome of their product because of pollination. And that applies across pip fruits, apples, pears, the whole nine yards, and right through down to the small seed sector in mid Canterbury with the uh, carrots and brassicas and onions. Those people will be part of our uh, GIA and they will be paying alongside us because they need the bees more than in fact probably just as much as we need for our own livelihoods. They need them even greater for the value of their products. So really important about that we get stuck into that and understand where we're going. Just lastly, um, Paul Bulger touched on top bar hives. It was interesting to listen to the talk, but I just want to clarify something. Nobody pro has a problem with the hive. The hive's fine. The issue, the debate is over the frame. And we have to understand that. And the issue is, can you remove that frame from the hive and inspect it for American fell fruit successfully? And that's really the only issue. I think that'd be fair to say, Franz. And the debate at the moment is not about top bar hives, and you'll hear plenty of people advocating for them, don't have a problem with that. It's just, is the is the frame of a sufficient quality to be able to remove that from that hive and inspect it for American value? And we need to keep really focused on that because too many talk about the coffins and all the other bits, but it's nothing to do with that. It's simply, can they be inspected correctly? And that's most important. All right, Barry. All good, thank you. Can take any questions if you